So welcome to Landmark Chambers webinar entitled Issues Around Lease Termination. We're delighted to see so many of you joining us today. My name's Miriam Stacey and I will chair today's session. I'm joined by my colleagues Nick Taggart, Richard Clark and Tom Morris, whom I will formally introduce in a moment. To begin with, a few housekeeping points to note, which I'm sure you're becoming pretty familiar with. Your microphones are automatically muted, so you won't need to adjust your local settings. This webinar will be recorded. You'll receive a link to the presentation and the recording shortly after the event concludes. We very much welcome questions throughout the session. Please submit them via the text in the Q&A, which you may find at the top or the bottom of your screen. We've got quite a lot to get through today, but timing permitting, we'll endeavour to answer as many questions as possible at the end of the presentation. Um, if your connection is lost at any point during the webinar, we'll invite you to rejoin the meeting by clicking on the original link. So I'll begin by introducing today's speakers. We've got Nick Taggart, who I'm sure will be well known to you. He's been rated as a top tier junior for real estate litigation in the directories for over 15 years and deals with just about any aspect of commercial landlord and tenant and real estate law, including all those dusty, obscure matters that no one in chambers really wants to do, such as mines and minerals, way leads, riparian rights and drainage. He's also a qualified arbitrator, an editor of Hill and Redmond, a member of editorial boards of various publications and sits on various committees. Richard Clark specialises in both commercial and residential landlord and tenant, together with real property. He's a member of the Attorney General's Panel Council and acts in areas where public and property law overlap. As well as advising on forfeiture claims, his recent cases have included acting for a landlord in a claim against a pub tenant for rent arrears which accrued during the lockdown. And finally, Tom Morris is also a property litigation specialist. He has a practice covering all areas of commercial and residential property. He regularly appears on behalf of landlords in possession claims is involved in fast track, multi-track trials, first here in upper tribunals, and he will be appearing for the landlord in an upcoming appeal in the Court of Appeal against the rent payment order made in an unlicensed HMO case. Now, before we start, I will very briefly explain the structure of what we'll be doing today. It's all pretty straightforward. We've got four talks on topics to do with lease termination. Each talk lasts 15 minutes, and then we'll conclude with some questions. So on to the talks. Um, I will kick things off with the first of the four talks, which is entitled Break Clauses and Vacant Possession. Now, the word unprecedented may be in danger of imploding through overuse, but it's still an accurate way of describing the speed and scale of the changes and uncertainties brought about by the COVID-19 pandemic. There's been talk about the death of the office, about uncertainty of the future of the high street. And although tenants have been given breathing space by the government measures, rent continues to be payable. Business dislikes uncertainty. And as the implications of the pandemic continue to be absorbed, tenants and landlords have been examining their leases like never before. And in this climate, their interests pull in opposite directions with commercial tenants looking for ways to reduce their overheads and improve their cash flow and rid themselves of leases which are no longer fit for purpose. Uh, break laws presents them with a valuable means of taking back control. Whereas landlords faced with the difficult reletting market, the prospect of empty premises and anxious to maintain their income streams will no doubt be doing what they can to keep tenants locked in. Given those competing interests, I expect we will soon be seeing a surge in break clause cases. Even before the pandemic, break clauses were regularly the source of dispute. Back in July 2020, when giving his judgment in the case of GKN Aerospace, Mr. Justice Fancourt opened his judgment by saying, this is yet another case about the exercise of a break clause in a lease. So at the heart of the problem, at least for tenants, is that the courts have notoriously applied a strict test to compliance. Small errors in the wording of a break may be capable of being saved by the reasonable recipient test in Mani, but mandatory requirements must be strictly and precisely adhered to. And the effect is that any failure will render the break ineffective, no matter how trivial the lapse. So a small error can cause a catastrophic loss or a lucrative gain, depending on which side you're on. Hardly surprising then that break clauses are so often the subject of dispute. Now, 
this is a technical area and 50 minutes, 15 minutes is very little time to do justice to it. The technical requirements range from getting the contents of a notice right to ensuring it's served on the correct person by the correct party in the correct manner at the correct time before one even comes on to break laws preconditions. And the case law throws up all sorts of cautionary tales which serve to confirm that tenants both large and small would be well served to take legal advice before deploying a break clause, even if it appears to be simply worded. For today's purposes, I am going to concentrate on various aspects of the vacant possession precondition, which despite the commercial lease code is still regularly to be found in leases, either by way of a direct precondition requiring vacant possession or indirectly by virtue of an obligation to comply with covenants, which include a covenant to yield up at the end of the term. So what does vacant possession mean? Well, on the face of it, there's no particular difficulty with the concept. It's been said to be uncomplicated. It essentially means that at the moment vacant possession is required to be given, the property must be empty of people and that the tenant can assume and enjoy immediate and exclusive possession, occupation and control without being troubled by the presence of chattels that would substantially prevent or interfere with its enjoyment of the property, or at least a substantial part. Now, it might be thought that returning the property free of what's been described as the trilogy of people, legal interests and chattels in accordance with the ordinary meaning of vacant possession would be well within a tenant's control and achievable, with a bit of forward planning. But as is apparent from the case law, things that appear uncomplicated are not always so easy to get right. A reminder that the date on which vacant possession must be given is midnight on the specified date, which is generally the term date, and not a minute later. The task of the court is to look objectively at what's occurred on that date and to determine whether the tenant has manifested a clear intention to effect a termination and whether the landlord could, if it wanted to, occupy the premises without difficulty or objection. And if the tenant's fallen short of that, it cannot retrieve its position by saying it was in a position to give vacant possession or had no intention of excluding the landlord. So to take an example, in the Ibrin case, which is referred to on the slide, the break clause was not correctly exercised when the tenant remained on the premises to carry out dilapidations repairs after the specified date. That was said to be a continued assertion of control and rights which were inconsistent with the landlord's right of possession. The tenant's plea that it could easily have downed tools and left the warehouse the moment the landlord asked it to was irrelevant as a matter of principle. But these cases are always fact sensitive. So whilst the presence of the tenants in that case defeated the break, the presence of security guards in an earlier case of John Lang in 2004 was not a manifestation of the tenant's intention to assert ongoing rights because it was explicable on the basis of the tenant's desire to keep the premises safe. So fact sensitive and an objective test. So with that general point in mind, I'm going to touch on three specific aspects relating to the requirement of vacant possession. The first point is vacant possession of what? The tenant needs to properly identify the object of the vacant possession condition. What is the thing of which vacant possession must be given? That will normally be the demised premises or some similar expression. And as the premises will exclude anything that's not demised, the critical starting point is to look carefully at how the lease in question defines that expression. So as mentioned, tenants chattels must be removed, at least where there would be substantial interference with the right of possession on the basis that chattels don't normally form part of the premises. But as confirmed in the Riverside Park case, chattels are not invariably limited to loose items, so things that would fall out if you held the building upside down and shook it. In that case, freestanding standard demountable partitions, which were held in place by screw fixings affixed to the raised floor and to the suspended ceiling, were held to be chattels, which ought to have been removed by the tenant. The position might have been different if they'd been fixed differently in such a way as to form part of the internal structure. The premises will include anything which have become part of the premises by, by annexation, although special consideration needs to be given to tenants' fixtures. So a tenant's fixture, as we'll all know, is installed by the tenant for the purposes of his trade and forms part of the premises at, on installation, but is subject to a tenant's right, although not an obligation to remove it. 
lease drafting varies regarding the treatment of tenants fixtures and so tenants always need to check whether they need to be removed as part of the vacant possession obligation. So for example, if a lease expressly includes tenants fixtures within the definition, the position is very straightforward. Tenant has a right to remove them but can safely choose to leave them there in place at the end of the term. If the lease is silent as to whether they're included, they will remain part of the demise if the tenant again chooses not to remove them. If the lease expressly excludes tenants fixtures, the safe course is probably to remove them, but the point remains undecided. So in the Riverside Park case, the judge did say in over to comments that if the partitions had not been chattels, they were tenants fixtures. And he said they should have been removed as they were excluded from the definition of the premises. But those were over to comments. And the counter argument might be that the purpose of an exclusion of tenants fixtures from the demise premise definition is simply intended to reflect the right of the tenant to remove the tenants fixtures, but is insufficient to place an obligation on it to remove them as part of a vacant possession condition without further drafting. In Goldman Sachs, the case that was referred to on the earlier slide, 2018, the court noted that the point remained open but declined to decide it. And the position becomes more complicated where the last bullet point, the premises excludes tenants fixtures, so the safe course is to remove them, but includes other things such as other fixtures, alterations, additions or improvements. Now, obviously, items which are expressly included can safely be left, but the categorization of what constitutes a tenant's fixture as opposed to a landlord's fixture or an improvement or addition or alteration will often be finely balanced. It may even require expert evidence. And that presents a difficulty for tenants and their advisors to be clear as to whether a particular item must be removed or left in order to ensure strict compliance with the vacant possession obligation. So the takeaway is tenants should obtain early professional advice to enable them to properly identify the demise premises and plan the works that are required. The second point is that the tenant will need to check other provisions in the lease which may affect the extent of what needs to be done to give vacant possession. Specifically, leases often contain a separate covenant by the tenant to reinstate. Reinstate alterations, improvements and additions installed by the tenant in the course of the term at lease expiry. The question may arise then as to whether that covenant, which is given independently of the vacant possession obligation, the break clause, feeds nevertheless into the precondition and requires those relevant things to be removed as part of the precondition. Now the answer to that will invariably turn on the specific language of the lease, but it is a question which was considered relatively recently in the Goldman Sachs case. In that case, getting it right was going to save the tenant 20 million in rent, so the tenant brought a part eight claim to get clarity on precisely what was required to operate the break right successfully on the break date. And the provisions in question in that lease were set out on the slide. So clause 23.1 was the break option and it was said to be subject to the tenant being able to yield up the premises with a vacant possession as provided in clause 23.2. 23.2 said on expiration of such notice the term shall cease and determine and the tenant shall yield up the premises in accordance with clause 11 and with full vacant possession. Clause 11 contained the obligations for reinstatement. The question for determination was whether the break option in clause 23.1 required the tenant to carry out the reinstatement set out in clause 11 as a precondition, or whether failure to do that simply sounded in damages. The tenant argued that reinstatement was not a precondition or part of the precondition, and the tenant, sorry, the landlord argued that it was. Now, in the interest of making things interactive, I am going to try and put up a poll. So who won the case? Was it the tenant or was it the landlord? A little bit of time to go through that. Mm -hmm, interesting. Okay, I'm gonna end the poll and share the results. So most people thought it was the landlord. Well, in fact, the correct answer is the tenant. It was not a precondition of the break laws for uh, the tenant to reinstate. And the reason for that, what helped the tenant in its argument was 
essentially three things. First is the fact that clause 23.2 contained two separate requirements, so clause 11 and full vacant possession, whereas clause 23 only mentioned one of those. Interestingly, the judge suggested that if the wording of 23.1 had read vacant possession and as provided in clause 23.2, things might have gone the other way. So a missing and might have made the difference between saving of 20 million in rent. The second point the court was influenced by was the fact that the reinstatement obligation contained discretionary elements, so reasonable satisfaction of the landlord, which the court thought made it difficult for a tenant to assess whether the break clause had been validly exercised or not. And thirdly and finally, um, the contra preferentum rule helped the tenants. So if the landlord had required reinstatement as well as vacant possession, it should have spelt it out. So always a question of construction. The issues can be finely balanced as, as is apparent from the poll results. Which brings me on to my third and final point. When it comes to deciding how empty to leave a premise is, a tenant will need to form a view about how much or how little to remove and we'll need to strike the right balance between removing enough, but not removing too little. But yeah, but not removing too much. Um, the so-called not complicated concept of vacant possession uh, described by Lord Justice Reimer in the Ibrin case may not require the premises to be returned 100% pristine, but it does nevertheless require the tenant to yield up the premises and also for them to be yielded up in such a way that there is no substantial impediment facing the landlord to its right of immediate occupation and enjoyment. So in the past, given the strict need for compliance, strict compliance, the, evident, the advice given to tenants is that they should remove perhaps more than might strictly be necessary out of an abundance of caution to be sure that nothing is left behind that should have been removed. And that advice might well have assisted the government body occupying the offices in the Secretary of State and um, South Essex College case, where the continued presence of a relatively small quantity of chattels in, did imperil the break. So in that case, the tenant had left items which consisted largely of computer screens, a photocopier, box of files and cabling, and the landlord's own witnesses accepted in cross-examination that the items were largely quite portable and did not prevent use of the rooms. But the continued presence of those items was said to be more akin to an abandonment of the premises than a delivery up, and viewed objectively was said to suggest the tenant continued to store goods there and was therefore continuing to make use of the premises after expiring. But the general tendency towards giving tenants caution, cautious advice, i.e. remove more, may now need to be revisited in light of the recent case of Capital Park Leeds in Global Radio Services. This is an interesting and unusual case in that most of the cases focus on what the tenant has left behind, but this one focused on how much was removed. Remember the starting point is always to identify what is the thing of which vacant possession has to be given. And the definition of the premises in, the goal, in, that, in that case was central to the landlord's argument. It included all fixtures and fittings at the premises and all additions and improvements, but it excluded tenants' fixtures. The tenant, in addition to removing tenants' fixtures, removed 17 original fittings ranging from ceiling tiles to a smoke detection system, pipework, radiators and cables. Didn't replace them before the break date. According to the judge, that left the landlord with an empty shell of a building which was dysfunctional and unoccupiable. And he held that by stripping out the landlord's fixtures and fittings, as well as the tenants, the tenant had not given vacant possession of the premises as defined. He also, interestingly, read the no substantial impediment test expansively, so as to extend beyond physical impediments in the form of remaining chattels to include an absence of things, i.e. an absence of essential fixtures and fittings, which was said to amount to a substantial impediment to the landlord's ability to use the premises or a substantial part on the specified date. Now, the appeal in that case is due to be heard very soon, with John Mayle QC of these chambers acting for the tenant. So watch this space. It will certainly be interesting to see whether the Court of Appeal takes the same view as the High Court. But for present purposes, the judgment serves as a useful reminder that vacant possession does not simply mean leaving the premises empty, and it serves to further highlight the importance of identifying as a critical starting point what the demised premises consists of. <laughs>
And on that note, I will hand over to Nick Taggart, who's going to talk to you about frustration. Hello, everybody. Uh, I hope you're all well, and I hope you're all uh, keeping positive and testing negative. So uh, my talk today is called Whose Risk Is It Anyway? Uh, and it investigates the frustration of leases. We all know that the frustration of leases is possible um, because the House of Lords told us that in National Carriers and Panalpina. And we all have a working understanding of the doctrine of frustration too. It, it's the doctrine that deals with when stuff happens. If something unexpected and unforeseen occurs, which makes the further discharge of the contract uh, either impossible or a radically different thing from that which was envisaged, the contract is discharged. Well, uh, we might all think that the COVID-19 uh, pandemic is a pretty prime example of stuff happening. It's made the running of retail, leisure, hospitality businesses from leasehold premises either impossible or at least a radically different proposition from that which was envisaged when the lease was granted. We might say that the fundamental uh, assumption underlying a lease of property like that is that the tenant's got the property, the customers come through the door, they spend the money, that generates the income, that pays the rent and job done. So no customers, no rent, no point, no lease. Simple. That, that really ought to be how frustration works. But is it? Well, in uh, the recent case of Bank New York Mellon International and Cine UK, the High Court declined to hold that the pandemic was a frustrating event. One might say if that doesn't frustrate a lease of a retail, leisure or hospitality uh, premises, what on earth does? What level of catastrophe does it actually require? That's a jolly good question, and I hope I'm going to try and answer it in this paper. So I'm going to start off doing something a little bit odd, but, you know, that's me doing things a little bit odd, um, by talking about two conveyancing cases. Now, the reason why I'm going to do that is this. The House of Lords in Panalpina got really, really tied up as to whether or not um, a, a lease could ever be frustrated because a lease creates an interest in land and therefore there was a lot of debate as to whether an interest in land could be destroyed through a frustrating event. In contracts of the sale and purchase of freehold property, that problem doesn't arise because if the contract is frustrated, the freehold estate simply stays with the seller. Therefore, it ought to be the case that there's going to be a lot of cases out there uh, where sale and purchase contracts have been frustrated. Hmm. But there aren't. Despite all the terrible things that have happened to the property market since, say, World War One and the 1918 Spanish flu pandemic, there have only been, as far as I can see, two reported cases relating to the frustration of sale and purchase of freeholds uh, in which frustration has been argued. And in both cases, the argument failed. It's actually quite useful to have a look at why. Exhibit A is a case called Amalgamated Investment and John Walker. Uh, it's a case from 1973 when £1.7 million was an awful lot of money rather than just a lot of money. That was the purchase price that Amalgamated agreed to pay um, to buy a warehouse in the then not trendy commercial road from Walker. Both parties understood that the, the, the idea behind the purchase was that Amalgamated would develop it and then, uh, sorry, demolish the warehouse and then redevelop it as a ritzy uh, residential block. But two days after exchange of contracts, the warehouse was listed, making demolition impossible. Amalgamated sought a uh, declaration from the court that the contract was discharged through frustration. Uh, but the Court of Appeal said, nope. And uh, to quote from the judgments, disappointed expectations do not necessarily lead to frustrated contracts. First judgment was from Lord Justice Buckley, who observed that the sale and purchase contract, when you, you strip it down to its basics, requires the seller to provide the title to the land that he had contracted to provide and the buyer to provide the agreed purchase price. And that was it. Listing of the building was not a matter of title. Amalgamated was getting exactly what it had bargained for. It's just that it couldn't use it for the purposes that it wanted to use it for. So for Lord Justice Buckley, uh, that was why the contract couldn't be frustrated. The risk that the building couldn't be used for the intended purpose lay entirely on the buyer because the seller, all he had to do was provide the title he contracted to provide. Lord Justice Lawton agreed, and he actually went further. He said there's all sorts of property hazards in these days. There's a hazard not only of changes in planning, such as listing, but there are changes in taxation, fiscal regulation, all kinds of things. And he said 
that in a sale and purchase contract, the risk always has to land on the uh, buyer because all the seller has to do is provide the title to the land that he says he's going to provide. The third judge was Sir John Pennycook and he agreed too. He said it didn't matter either that the uh, purchase price was predicated on there being a redevelopment and that the purchase price would have been much lower had the parties anticipated the building being uh, listed. He said that what you had to look at was the obligations that stood to be discharged and they were made not impossible nor indeed actually more onerous. He said they might be more expensive and that the developer might make an awful lot less profit but that wasn't the point. That wasn't what the contract was about. The contract was about the passage of a title in exchange for money. The same sort of uh, uh, result happened in the other case, uh, which I should mention briefly, which is Universal Corporation and Five Ways. It's another sale and purchase case, this time involving a rather ritzy freehold in uh, London's Marylebone. The purchaser was Universal. It was a Nigerian company. And in order to pay the purchase price, it needed to remit the funds from Nigeria. Due to a completely unexpected change in exchange controls, by the time uh, that uh, Universal got the money on shore in order to complete, uh, Five Ways had served a notice to complete, rescinded the contract, forfeited the deposit, and was in the process of trying to sell the, con the property to somebody else. Universal sought a, a declaration that the contract had been frustrated and that it should have its deposit back on that basis. The matter came at first instance before Mr Justice Walton. It's worth reading out pretty much the only thing he said about that argument. He said, quite emphatically, the doctrine of frustration cannot be brought into play merely because the purchaser finds, for whatever reason, he's not got the money to complete the contract. The case went to the Court of Appeal, uh, where it was that chap Buckley again, and he said that what uh, Walton, uh, had, uh, Mr Justice Walton had said was an accurate and proper statement. Uh, he effectively said that the um, as he had said in the earlier case, that the buyer takes all the risks going forward. Now, those are the two cases, and here's just a thought. If the risk of not having the money to pay for a property in a sale and purchase contract invariably lies on the buyer, why does the uh, risk of not being able to pay the rent because of unforeseen circumstances always fall on the tenant? Is that perhaps something to do with the law of frustration? Let's have a little look at the law of frustration. Now, as I said, we all, we all have the, a grip of the basics. It's the stuff happens doctrine. But it's important, I think, to see that, that the doctrine has, has evolved because the first case that we find uh, in the House of Lords on frustration is a case called Tamplin Steamship, which I suspect many of us will have been taught back in the day, in which um, Lord Chancellor Lord Loraburn put the doctrine of frustration in very wide and loose terms. What he said was a court can and ought to examine the contract and the circumstances in which it was made. Not, of course, to vary it, but to explain it in order to see whether from the nature of it, the parties have made their bargain on the footing that a particular thing or state of things would continue to exist. And if they have done so, then a term will be implied to that effect that the contract is frustrated if the circumstances change. Now, that's important because it's no longer important. Lord Loribund's test is now officially dead and should be allowed to lie down. The first tire um, interment was in the House of Lords case called Davis Contractors and Fairham District Council, and it puts the test in far more stringent terms. Facts are interesting. Davis agreed with the council to build 78 council houses by a specific date. Due to a, a national shortage in labour, Davis couldn't complete the build in time, although it did finish the build later. It argued that the failure of the supply of skilled labour frustrated the contract, and so it was entitled to be paid on a quantum merit uh, basis, which, ha, surprise, surprise, was much higher than the contract price. It is fair to say that that argument bombed. Um, and before I go into why it bombed, here's just the thought. If not having enough labourers available in the market doesn't frustrate a building contract, then why does not having enough customers in the market frustrate the lease of a shop or a gym or a restaurant? Isn't it the same thing? Hmm. Come back to that. Yeah, that as it may, um, the House of Lords took the opportunity to restate the doctrine of frustration and did so in much more rigorous terms than Lord Loribund had. 
uh, as we know from later judgments, the leading speech is actually Lord Radcliffe, who said this, frustration occurs whenever the law recognises that without default of either party, a contractual obligation has become incapable of performance because the circumstances in which performance is called for would render it a thing radically different from that which was undertaken by the contract, so that it can be said, this was not what I promised to do. He went on to say that inconvenience, hardship or material loss of profitability did not in itself bring the frustration doctrine into play. There's got to be a radical change in circumstances which affects the future performance of the obligation. And that's the important thing. You're not looking at the general circumstances in which the contract is to be performed going forward. You're looking as to whether the performance can be rad said to be radically changed. Now, the next case is one that we all know. It's National Carriers and Panel Pena. That's the next uh, House of Lords or Supreme Court level case. And as I'm sure you all remember, that's a, a case as to whether the 10 year lease of a warehouse was frustrated by compulsory closure, the only vehicular access to it, for 20 months. The leading speech in terms of the law has become Lord Simon's. And for these purposes, I think the only bit of it I, I'm going to pick out is this. He said, the tenants were undoubtedly put to considerable expense and inconvenience, but that is not enough. In light of the quantitative computation, that's say the difference caused by the closure of the road and all the relevant factors from which I would not entirely exclude executed performance, would outstanding performance in accordance with the literal terms of the contract differ so significantly from what the parties reasonably contemplated that it would be unjust to insist on compliance. And that's again the important point. You're looking at the discharge of the future obligations, not the abstract circumstances. Has that performance been changed? Now, the case arrived at the House of Lords as a summary judgment application by the landlord for non-payment of rent. By a majority of 4-1, the House held that the tenant's defence of frustration did not raise a triable issue. They dismissed it out of hand. Now, the best explanation of why actually comes from Lord Wilberforce's speech. And he picked out two things. He said, first, the obligation to pay rent is unconditional, save in the case of fire, when there's a, a standard rent cessor obligation. The risk of being able to use the premises for the future, therefore, lay wholly on the tenant. Secondly, he said that although the uh, warehouse would be unusable for uh, nearly two years out of a 10 year term, the tenants would be put to significant costs. Uh, and they'd have to acquire alternative premises, move their business there and then move their business back all the time whilst paying the rent. He said that those facts did not even begin to approach the gravity of a frustrating event. Lord Simon agreed. He said, I do not think that the applicants have demonstrated a tribal issue. Uh, that the closure of the road has so significantly changed the nature of the outstanding rights obligations under the lease from what the parties could have reasonably contemplated. Well, that's again reinforces the point I'm trying to make. Does the supervening event change the nature of the actual obligations rather than the circumstances in which the obligations fall to be discharged? A House of Lords case, just one, uh, uh, sorry, House of Lords level, there's just one more case for me to mention. That's a shipping case called the NEMA, which is important for one reason only. In it, the House of Lords speaking through Lord Roskill said the doctrine of frustration was fully defined by Lord Radcliffe in Davis Construction and Lord Simon in Panalpina and that there should be no further recourse to earlier authorities. So that sort of wishy-washy, oh, well, look at all the circumstances stuff from Lord Lorribon, that should have gone. I want to now just mention one Court of Appeal case, um, the facts of which are Brilliant. If you've got time to read it for laughs, have a look at a case called the Sea Angel, which is a court of appeal decision from 2007. Um, without all the gags in it, the facts of the Sea Angel are this. Uh, a charterer chartered a, a salvage vessel called the Sea Angel for 20 days from the owner. And under that uh, contract of charter, uh, the basis of it was that the Sea Angel would be re-delivered to a specified port at the end of the 20 days, or if it wasn't, that the, chart, uh, the salvage company would continue to pay something called the off-hire rate, which is uh, an agreed sum for every day that she was late in being returned. They tried to set sail after 17 days, but the Harbour Authority uh, impounded the Sea Angel illegally, unlawfully, unreasonably, and basically downright held her to ransom for a further 108 days, despite a, an order of the local High Court. Um, it's, it's wild out there sometimes. Did that frustrate the contract? 
Court of Appeal said no for two reasons. Firstly, they said that the uh, the unauthorised and unreasonable detention of salvage vessels by um, port authorities was a known and acknowledged risk within the industry. Who knew? And secondly, they, perhaps most importantly for our purposes, they said that the clause providing for the off hire rate if the ship was uh, not returned in time showed that the risk of non-performance was allocated but under the contract to the charterer, not to the owner. Therefore, they had to pay. That's a really important point for landlord and tenant cases. And that's why I'm going to look briefly now at one of the uh, more recent High Court cases on frustration, which is the Brexit case, Canary Wharf and the European Medicines uh, Agency. Sure, you'll all remember this one too. The EMA said that Brexit frustrated its 25-year lease of an office intended to house its headquarters uh, because it didn't like us anymore and it wanted to take its bat and ball home and go off in a huff back to somewhere abroad in the EU, where that might be these days. Anyway, much of the judgments is taken up with uh, arguments on Ill illegality, but once those are all stripped away, the point on frustration is actually really rather simple. Uh, the judge said that uh, there were really only two points. Could the uh, medicines agency discharge its obligations under the lease? And did the lease allocate the risk that the agency would no longer want the premises? He said, absolutely, of course it did, because the lease was assignable. It contained uh, provisions for uh, not only subletting in part, but also subletting in whole and for assignment. Therefore, the risk that the uh, agency would no longer want the premises and have to hang on to them until they were assigned lay with the agency. Now, I don't mean any disrespect to Master Dagnall, but I'm not going to go into his recent decision in Bank of New York Mellon, because actually it's, it's just a working through of those principles. What I'm actually going to do is come to some conclusions. Uh, now, I started with the two conveyancing cases because the Court of Appeal had no problem in saying it's axiomatic in that situation uh, that the, the risk is allocated to the buyer in all circumstances. In Panel Pina, Lord Wilberforce acknowledged that, but said that the position in respect of leases might be different because not all leases might allocate risks as clearly as a sale and purchase contract does. Well, as a statement of, of principle, uh, um, that, that must be right, at least in the abstract. But the logic of the allocation of risk doctrine as derived from those cases shows, I think, that it's actually impossible for any lease dra drafted in common modern forms to ever be frustrated. The reason I say this is that Panel Pena itself demonstrates it. Unless drafted on exceptional or eccentric basis, the allocation of risk always lies on the tenant. Because stripped of the basics, any lease is this. The landlord grants the tenant an exclusive possession of the land for a term in exchange for which the tenant pays the rent. Therefore, the future risks are on the tenant. See, at the irreductible minimum, the landlord's ongoing obligation is just to provide quiet enjoyment. By the very de de uh, sorry, definition of frustration, the landlord can't rely on his own breaches of that covenant to frustrate the lease, of course. But everything else that interrupts the tenant's enjoyment of the premises is not the landlord's problem because he hasn't contracted to do anything other than provide the premises without interference from himself. Now, yes, of course, he may have other obligations under the risk, but the risk of non-performance is actually allocated by those contracts. For example, if the landlord's obligation to repair isn't performed, well, then the risk of that lies on the landlord because he gets sued for a uh, breach of that covenant. And if Panel Pino's logic followed through, then the fact that perhaps it may be really difficult to perform that um, uh, repairing obligation, perhaps because you can't get the materials or you can't get the labour, it doesn't have the gravity to discharge the lease as a whole. By contrast, the tenant's uh, continuing obligation is pay rent. Uh, in any lease, competently drawn or indeed otherwise, that obligation is usually unqualified. It is just the time honoured, yielding or paying throughout the term. There you go, that's that. And it's qualified only by reference, in some cases anyway, to rent cessor clauses, which are in known and defined terms. If they don't apply, if they're not engaged by what's happened, then the tenant's obligation is to pay the rent throughout the term. Indeed, you can see other things that, that tell us that that's the case. The very existence, for example, of the usual proviso for re-entry shows that the risk of non-performance of any covenant 
lies with the tenant because the proviso will invariably be drafted as to operate independently of the tenant's ability to make use of the premises. Even if the tenant finds it impossible to pay the rent, well, he bears the risk because that's his covenant, it's his obligation. And going back to the uh, the Sea Angel case, tenant impecuniosity and insolvency is a thoroughly well-known risk within the property industry, and the risk doesn't lie on the landlord under the lease. It lies on the tenant because it's his obligation to pay. So it seems to me that um, despite Lord Wilberforce's observations that the freehold cases might be different, I don't actually think they are. Uh, in every properly drawn lease, all the risks of non-performance actually lie on the tenant, not the landlord. The landlord's obligation is simply, boiled down to it, don't interrupt the tenant's possession yourself. So I think all that remains for me is to leave you with this observation from uh, Lord Chancellor Lord Hailsham in the panel Pena case. He said this, I am struck by the fact that there appears to be no reported English case where a lease has ever been held to be frustrated. I hope that this fact will act as a suitable deterrent to the litigious, eager to make legal history by being the first in this field. Ladies and gentlemen, now the pubs are open, I'll drink to that. This is Nick Taggart, West London, handing over to Richard Clark. Right, thank you for that, uh, Nick. Uh, on to uh, the subject of my talk, which is forfeiture and waiver. Yeah. Now, as should be uh, familiar to most of us, uh, forfeiture is the exercise of a contractual right to determine a lease upon the happening of a specified event. Uh, first principles, always check the lease. If there's no forfeiture clause, then there is no right to forfeit. Uh, importantly, it's a right, not an obligation. The landlord is put to an election. Now, uh, for breaches other than a non-payment of rent, you of course need to serve a section 146 notice, uh, giving the chance uh, for the tenant to remedy those breaches which are capable of remedy. Um, I don't have time to get into it, but I've put a case on the slide that tells us that most breaches can be uh, remedied and those that can't is an ever shrinking list. Uh, now there are significant restrictions on the ability to forfeit long residential leases. And um, I don't have time to get into them in this talk, uh, but for those who have cases where you're looking to forfeit a long residential lease, uh, the starting point is go and check the restrictions. Uh, the summary is for most breaches, you'll need a determination from the first tier tribunal that there has in fact been a breach or an admission by the tenant. Uh, a restriction that's relevant for our purposes uh, and a recent one, is imposed by section 82 of the Coronavirus Act 2020. Uh, it's up on the slide. Uh, a right of re-entry or forfeiture under a business tenancy for non-payment of rent may not be enforced by action or otherwise during the relevant period. Uh, the relevant period uh, is currently due to end on the 30th of June 2021. Uh, it may however be extended and I believe it, that the June date is itself is an extended date. Uh, so with those preliminary remarks in mind, I'd like to turn to waiver of the right to forfeit. Uh, the starting point is that it's important to bear in mind a distinction between waiving a breach of covenant for all purposes, which would, for example, preclude you from bringing an action even in damages, versus waiver of the right to forfeit the lease as a consequence of that breach of covenant. Uh, and it's the latter form of waiver, waiving the right to forfeit, that I'm going to be focusing on today. Uh, so when will there be a waiver of the right to forfeit? Uh, there are three criteria that have to be met. Uh, the landlord must have knowledge of the tenant's breach, perform an unequivocal act recognising the lease is continuing, and communicate that act to the tenant. Now, an important point to note, uh, confirmed in the central Belgravia case, is that once that election is made, the landlord is irrevocably bound by it. What is done is done. Uh, now, returning briefly to the Coronavirus Act, uh, Section 82.2 uh, provides that during the relevant period, i.e. to the end of June as currently drafted, uh, where the Act itself stops you forfeiting a business tenancy for non-payment of rent, no conduct by the landlord during the relevant period is to be regarded as a waiver. Uh, 
so for the time in which the act itself prevents you from forfeiting for the non-payment of rent, uh, you don't have to worry that you may have accidentally waived during that period. Uh, a point we'll return to uh, is the extent to which you can waive a right to forfeit where there are other fetters on your ability to forfeit the lease. So I'm going to take the three criteria that I've just outlined in turn. Uh, the first is knowledge of the breach. Now, the starting point is that the test for the landlord's knowledge of the breach is objective. Uh, the Court of Appeal reiterated recently in Burnley Borough Council that what the landlord must have knowledge of are at least the basic facts which constitute the relevant breach. Uh, now, there's a couple of points to be aware of here. Uh, the first is that knowledge can be imputed to the landlord by various means. Uh, firstly, uh, knowledge can be imputed to a landlord which was, which was acquired by their employees. Uh, and I've put a case on the slides, the Metropolitan Properties case. Uh, what happened there was that the landlord employed porters at the property who had a duty to report matters to the landlord. Uh, and there, the porters became aware that somebody was subletting. And so that knowledge was imputed to the landlord. And what the court explained there was, when employees with a duty to report matters became aware of the breach, a, a reasonable time would be allowed for the employees to realise the significance of what they were seeing and to report it to the landlord. But once that time had passed, the knowledge would be imputed to the landlord. Uh, secondly, the Central Estates case tells us that exactly the same principle applies uh, for an agent. Uh, in that case, there was an estate agent managing the property as an agent of the landlord and the estate agent's knowledge of the breach was uh, imputed to the landlord. Uh, are there any exceptions to that principle? Well, yes, there are. It ultimately is a, is a fact-specific exercise. Uh, an example of where knowledge wasn't imputed is the older case of Birch. Uh, what happened in that case was that a father was the landlord and their son was, was acting on their behalf for certain limited at, uh, respects in regards to the property. And when the son was attending the property, they were in the presence of unauthorised alterations. Uh, but where there was a limited form of authority and no duty to report the breach, uh, the court found that the son's no, uh, pres knowledge of the alterations wasn't to be imputed to his father. So that in some limited agency cases, the knowledge won't necessarily be imputed. There is case law to confirm that mere suspicion that there's a breach isn't enough. And when suspicion becomes knowledge is, is probably a factual sliding scale. Uh, and another caveat to the principle is that if a landlord suspects there's a breach and the landlord then represents that there isn't dishonestly or untruthfully, and the landlord is and where the landlord's not sufficiently confident in the untruth of what's said, uh, then the landlord uh, won't be found to have uh, known the facts of the breach. I've put a case up on the screen. What happened there was that a tenant asked for permission to sublet. The landlord said no. Uh, the landlord then, the tenant then moved abroad and entered into a sham agreement with somebody to be their caretaker when in fact it was a subletting. Uh, and they told the landlord, well, this is just a caretaker or a housekeeper. Uh, it was that dishonesty that meant that the landlord wasn't imputed to have knowledge of the breach of covenant by the subletting. An important point is that the burden of proof of showing knowledge is on the tenant. What the tenant must show is that the landlord had knowledge of the breach at the time the election was made. And we'll come to the Burnley Borough Council case to see why that's important. So that's knowledge. Uh, what acts recognise the continuation of the tenancy? Well, what the landlord must do is perform an unequivocal act, recognising that the lease continues to exist, uh, worth noting that is judged objectively and I've put some authority on the slide that the motive or intention of the landlord and the understanding of the tenant are equally irrelevant in assessing the quality of the act. Uh, an important point from the Matthews case is that you cannot act without prejudice to your right to forfeit. So for example you can't accept rent without prejudice to your case that you're entitled to forfeit. If you accept the rent that waives the right to forfeit. So what acts do in fact recognise the continuation of the tenancy? Well, I've just alluded to the major one, uh, acceptance of rent, which accrues after the breach, with knowledge of the breach when you accept the rent, will waive your ability to forfeit the tenancy. 
uh, and what was explained in the expert clothing case and the relevant passages up on the slide is that essentially acceptance of rent falls into a special category of its own such that really whatever the surrounding circumstances it is treated to be a wave a waiver of the relevant breach uh, what the court also confirmed there though is outside of that special case you look at all the circumstances of the case to decide whether or not the act has the unequivocal character that's required so which acts won't waive the right to forfeit uh, well there's some well-established categories demanding or accepting rent that accrued prior to the breach won't waive the right to forfeit um, you can forfeit without in any way relieving the tenant of its obligations that predated the breach um, serving a 146 notice of course won't breach, uh, won't waive the right to forfeit and the mere fact of entering into without prejudice negotiations with a tenant in and of itself also isn't a waiver and there's a, a case which is authority for that on the slide what about other acts uh, worth noticing that exercising commercial rent arrears recovery it's a right that can only be exercised either during the subsisting landlord and tenant relationship or after the end of a lease which did not end by forfeiture and the effect of those twin requirements is that the exercise of the right uh, will amount to a waiver of the right to forfeit and that's recently been confirmed by the court and the uh, citations on the slide generally speaking although you must look at all the circumstances exercising a contractual right premised upon the continued existence of the lease uh, is a waiver now that is dependent on the circumstances uh, and there's an interesting discussion in the stemp case uh, what happened there was that uh, because it was long residential leases there needed to be a determination by the first tier tribunal of the breaches before there could be any forfeiture and the court considered whether various acts that were undertaken prior to that determination uh, amounted to a waiver of the right to forfeit uh, there the court found that acts which wouldn't have amounted to waiver included addressing communications to leaseholders, uh, consulting with lessees about proposed repairs and relying on covenants regarding fire safety arrangements. Really the, the kind of tenure of the court's commentary there is that the landlord continuing to perform its obligations under the lease were acts of an equivocal character. Uh, do take note though it, that what the court also confirmed is it is possible to waive forfeiture during the period when you're precluded from exercising the right to forfeiture. So that would be unlike, for example, the coronavirus context. Uh, final requirements, the unequivocal act must be communicated to the tenant. Uh, that's a question of fact. Unless the act's communicated, there is no waiver. Um, a point that's familiar, when you're looking at whether you may have waived um, a right to forfeit uh, once and for all and continuous breaches, the importance of that is if you waive a once and for all breach that's it there's no right to forfeit in respect of it uh, a continuing breach uh, although you can waive the right to forfeit up to the date of your waiver they will be treated as a new breach the following day in which you can then uh, forfeit in respect of the ongoing breach and i've listed on the screen there uh, the various different examples of what a once and for all breach is and what are continuing now uh, Taking some of that and bringing it together, um, we can see that actions prior to the date of breach, of course, cannot waive uh, a right to forfeit. Uh, actions prior to your date of knowledge of the breach can't waive a right to forfeit. Uh, now that takes us to uh, the question which was considered in the Burnley Borough Council case. Now I've tried to illustrate it by the graphic on the screen. Um, at the date of the third arrow, you're accepting or demanding rent. You can demand or accept rent for what I've called rent period one, because those are all acts that predate the breach. Uh, you will waive your right to forfeit if you accept or demand rent for periods three or four, because at that date you have both knowledge um, and the breach has already happened. Uh, one period that's considered to be slightly less certain was what I've called rent period two. In other words, by the time you have knowledge and there's been a breach, can you accept rent that postdated the breach? but predated your date of knowledge. That was the question that the court recently considered in the Burnley Borough Council case. Uh, the facts are somewhat complicated. So again, I've tried to illustrate them via a graphic, uh, but you can see from the fat arrows on uh, at the bottom of the timeline that there was a uh, breach of covenant by an unlawful subletting 
and there was a factual uncertainty about precisely when it took place. It was no earlier than May 2019 and no later than October 2019. Uh, the insurance rent was demanded in September. It became due on the 2nd of October. Uh, the landlord gained knowledge of the sublease on the 18th of October. There was then a 146 notice. Uh, the landlord then sought to amend their previous demand for rent to reduce the period of rent claimed. Uh, that rent was then paid and accepted, and there was then peaceable re-entry. Uh, so the question uh, Lord Justice Lewison identified was whether the demand and acceptance of rent with knowledge uh, amounts to a waiver if the rent accrued after the breach, but before the landlord had knowledge of it, essentially my rental period too. Uh, it was recognised that previous cases and academic commentary didn't speak with one voice, uh, and the question had to be considered uh, was one of principle. So turning to first principles, uh, the court explained that what entitles the landlord to forfeit the lease for breach of covenant uh, is the breach. It's the breach that was relied on, not the date you became aware of it. Uh, so it does not matter whether the rent accrued due before or after the date of the landlord's knowledge. The relevant question is whether it accrued due before or after the date of the breach about which the landlord now has knowledge. Uh, so the critical question was, did the, did the date on which the rent fall due, fell due precede or postdate the breach? Not did it predate or postdate the landlord's knowledge. Uh, the true principle, therefore, it's the bottom point on the slide, was that waiver takes place where a landlord demands or accepts rent, which accrued due after the date of the breach known to the landlord. So on that analysis, uh, it's the rental period two acceptance of rent that accrued during that period would amount uh, to a waiver of the right to forfeit. Uh, how did that apply to the facts of Burnley Borough Council? Well, just taking the three possible waiving acts in turn, uh, the invoice sent on the 26th of September, which accrued you on the 2nd of October, that didn't waive the right to forfeit. Uh, firstly, it was because the tenant has the burden of proving that the breach predated um, rent accruing and the, and the tenant was unable to prove it on that case because it was possible that the breach was in early October. And secondly, uh, all of the acts predated landlord's knowledge, therefore there could be no way from that act. Uh, as for the demand on the 4th of November, this is an interesting point of, of the Burnley case. Uh, the court held there that it wasn't a fresh demand for rent, uh, looked at on the facts, it was an acceptance of a lesser sum than that previously dem demanded by the previous invoice. And that could be seen by the reduced period of uh, rent demanded and the fact it was stated to be payable that day rather than seven days after demand in accordance with contractual machinery. Um, amending invoices though does seem to me to be a fairly high risk uh, thing to do, but on, that, on those facts didn't amount to waiver. But, and then finally accepting rent on the 11th, uh, by that point, the landlord knew the breach had taken place they didn't know when the breach had taken place other than that it was before the 18th. And on the facts there, the court found that the acceptance of rent hadn't been a waiver because uh, the, the council did not know that it was accepting rent accrued before the date of the breach. Um, one possible point of uncertainty is whether actually that last sentence was intended to read accrued after the date of the breach. Uh, because if rent accrued before the date of the breach, then knowledge doesn't come into it. You can simply claim rent that accrued prior to the date of the breach. Uh, so now we have some certainty on the rental period too, which has been explained by Burnley, which is that's another period in which a landlord needs to take uh, particular care to make sure they don't inadvertently uh, waive the right to forfeit. Uh, so with that, I'll say thank you for listening. Uh, and I'll hand you over to Tom Morris, who's going to bring us up to speed with uh, the recent reforms on residential premises and recovering possession. Thank you. Hello. Um, thank you, Richard. Um, I hope everyone is ready for an exciting foray into the thicket of uh, regulations which have been enacted over the last year, which have uh, circumscribed landlords property rights and uh, interfered in the relationships between landlord and tenant. Um, I will do my best to make this as interesting and fun as possible, uh, but I, I do need to refer to a large number of different regulations. Um, uh, so we start off with the famous eviction ban. Um, and uh, on this, there is at least some good news for landlords. Uh, just a reminder of, of how we got here. Um, this all 
uh, was enacted just ahead of the uh, third lockdown and the, the public health coronavirus protection from eviction England regulations. In essence, the regulations work by preventing any person attending a dwelling house for the purposes of executing a warrant or delivering a note of eviction. Um, and some of you may have recalled that the slightly bizarre and questionably lawful way in which the Lord Chancellor first tried to enact this ban by simply writing a letter to bailiffs, uh, inviting them not to do that. Uh, the, the legality of that was quite rightly questioned, um, and it was that uh, which resulted in the, uh, the, the ban, in inverted commas, being put on a regulatory footing. Now, that ban was originally to expire on the 21st of February 2021, uh, but uh, understandably, perhaps in a further blow to landlords, uh, the next uh, protection, for uh, protection from eviction regulations were enacted, and that just extended the ban until the 31st of March 2021. Again, in further bad news for landlords, that was of course extended again. There is now an amended expiry date of the 31st of May 2021 in just um, four days. And the good news is that so far, um, although of course with COVID anything can happen, it does look as though that is in fact a date which is set in stone. Uh, there is nothing to suggest at the moment that the government is going to extend the eviction ban uh, or reenact any eviction banning regulations. Uh, so that is one element of where we are. Uh, the next very important element is, whoops, uh, notice periods. This is the other area in which the, uh, the, the government has extensively interfered uh, uh, in, in statutes and in landlord and tenant relations. So there is a very, very useful table, which I urge everyone to look at if there are any, any doubt about what notice period they need to give or what notice period, period should have been given. Uh, and the link to that table is at the top of this slide. It's a, a gov.uk website, which summarizes pretty much uh, every notice period for every ground uh, on every relevant date. And uh, insofar as uh, today is concerned, uh, the, and in relation to some of the most important grounds, uh, uh, this is where we are. Since the 29th of August 2020, for a ground 8 or, or, or 11 claim, uh, you need to give four weeks notice where the arrears are, are at least six months. But where the arrears are less than six months, uh, you need to give six months notice. Uh, the government having taken the view that uh, six months of rent arrears is something with which landlords apparently cannot reasonably be concerned. Um, for the antisocial behaviour ground, um, the notice periods are a little bit shorter. You need to give four weeks for a periodic tenancy and one month for a fixed term tenancy. And for section 21 notices for the no fault eviction procedure, uh, for notices which were given between the 26th of March 2020 and the 28th of August 2020, at least three months notice needs to be given. But after the uh, uh, 29th of August 2020, which was uh, roughly when the stay on uh, possession claims was lifted, uh, any notices after that need to give at least six months, which was the sort of trade off that the government uh, enacted uh, when it lifted the stay. Uh, so that's where we are. Where are we going? Um, and very recently, the government put out this press release. Uh, and you'll note that the title uh, says support for renters continues with longer notice periods, which is a triumph of what I believe is called spin. Because as we're about to see, what the government has in fact done is reduced the notice periods uh, for tenants. So although this looks like it is in fact good news for tenants, and that is the way, uh, in fact, that the government has decided to present it, um, it is in fact uh, the opposite. So in summary, what is going to happen now is that um, all of the current six month notice periods are going to be reduced to four month notice periods. And the government in its press release uh, says uh, that this is going to be the case until at least the end of September. Now, given how much chopping and changing there has been and how many uh, waves of COVID have rolled in, uh, it's up to you to determine uh, the extent to which you're happy to take that at face value. But what we know is that from the beginning of June, shorter, slightly shorter notice periods will be introduced. Um, and uh, here are some useful um, uh, clues into the way that the government is thinking about this. These are two quotations from the press release. The first one is an absolutely atrocious metaphor. Uh, the move will ensure that renters are protected as we continue through the roadmap. Uh, and the next bullet point suggests that subject to public health advice and progress with the roadmap, uh, that presumably being the same roadmap that we've ripped to pieces by going through it in the previous bullet point, notice periods will return to pre-pandemic levels uh, from the 1st of October. Uh, and on that, we will wait and see. Uh, but there's just one slightly concerning thing to note, I think, which is that bailiffs have been asked not to carry out eviction uh, if anyone living in the property has COVID-19 symptoms or is self-isolating. Uh, now, it's unclear, I think, at the moment whether that um, 
request to bailiffs is actually going to be put on a uh, on a regulatory footing or whether it is just guidance either way it's not difficult to foresee tenants coming up with not particularly ingenious ways of uh, uh, putting off the fateful moment where they have to leave the property uh, by um, claiming a need to self-isolate uh, or, or indeed um, identifying um, COVID symptoms. Um, so that is the overview uh, and the government presentation, but in order to give effect to this um, glossy press release, there are some uh, new regulations which are being introduced, and I'm sorry I've skipped ahead two slides. The first of the new regulations that are going to give effect to this is the Coronavirus Act 2020 Residential Tenancies Protection from Eviction Amendment England Number 2 Regulations of 2021, which are effective from the 31st of May 2021. Um, and what this does is to amend Schedule 29 to the Coronavirus Act 2020 uh, to give effect to this four month notice period aim. Um, and one point to note is that Section um, 8, brackets 4BA, brackets A, brackets 2 of the Housing Act 1988, uh, which is something which was introduced to the Housing Act by the Coronavirus Act, is going to be amended so that the six months rent arrears threshold for giving only four weeks notice will be lowered to a four months rent arrears threshold. And from the 21st of August 2021, as if these dates and keeping track of them were not already hard enough, uh, the uh, notice period, uh, uh, the, the threshold, sorry, will be lowered to two months. Um, also important to note that section 8 4B A C of the Housing Act 1988 is going to be unamended by the new regulations. And what that means is that where there are more than four months rent arrears, uh, only four weeks notice will be required. And from the 21st of August, where there are um, more than uh, two months uh, rent arrears, uh, only two, uh, four weeks notice will be required. Um, so it's something to keep track of. Um, and it's important to make sure as you're going along that you use the right notice. Um, there are some more exciting new regulations coming in uh, in the form of the Assured Tenancies and Agricultural Occupancies Forms England Amendment and Suspension Coronavirus Regulations 2021. This comes into effect from the 1st of June and what it does is to insert new prescribed forms into the relevant prescribed forms regulations. So there is now going to be a new form 3 which is your uh, section 21 notice prescribed form and your new form 6a which is your uh, section 8 notice prescribed form. And so critically important to note, uh, particularly over the next few days, is that any Section 21 notice or Section 8 notice which is going to be sent before the 1st of June, but that will be deemed served after the 1st of June, should be in one of the new prescribed forms and not one of the existing prescribed forms. And to avoid any issues with the, uh, the, the gap that this creates, it may be pertinent to wait until after the 1st of June to give any notices at all. Um, so that concludes the, uh, the, the, the section on notices. Um, we now come on to the, uh, where we are procedurally. Uh, but what I want to do now is to ask a poll question. The question is, a Section 8 notice is served on the 30th of August 2021 in a case where the rent arrears are at three months. Uh, how much notice must be given? The answers are flooding in. Um, there is great variety. People are still voting. I will give it one more second. And I'm also just going to make sure I've got the correct answer in front of me because this is so confusing. So uh, I've ended the polling. I'm now going to uh, share the results. Um, and um, the, uh, everyone is pretty evenly spread. The correct answer is four months, which um, a narrow majority of people got right. Uh, but the fact that there has been such a wide range of answers highlights how difficult and complicated uh, this has all become and the importance of taking great care uh, in making sure that you are using the right notice in the right notice period. Um, so um, coming on to procedure, uh, we begin with uh, Practice Direction 55C, which is the coronavirus practice direction added to Part 55 of the CPR, which of course governs uh, possession proceedings. Uh, now, um, everyone will recall, of course, uh, that, that the government's um, originally imposed a stay on all possession proceedings and uh, proceedings to enforce possession orders. That stay was, of course, lifted um, at, at the end of the summer last year. And uh, what happens after the stay is listed is that uh, you were required to file a reactivation notice in order to get your claim back up and running. 
And what the practice direction says is that if you didn't file a reactivation notice by 4 p.m. on the 30th of April 2021, then your claim is automatically restayed. Uh, now, we're told by the practice direction that this is not a sanction. You don't need to make an application for relief from sanctions in order to get your claim up and running afterwards. Uh, but you do need to make an application to lift the stay. Uh, for new claims, which are claims brought after the 3rd of August 2020, um, it is very important to note this new requirement, which is that claimants must bring to the hearing, the substantive possession hearing, two copies of a notice setting out the knowledge that the party has as to the effect of the coronavirus pandemic on the defendant. You must bring two copies to the hearing, uh, puzzlingly, so if you have an electronic bundle which only has one copy in it, that will not be obviously sufficient. And it's also important to remember that you have to serve that notice on the defendant not less than 14 days before the hearing. Now, um, the practice direction is relatively um, not prescriptive in setting out the sort of knowledge that you that you have to include. And in fact, uh, given the, the stay and the fact that most landlords have rather disengaged with the process, uh, the answer in many cases might simply be that the, uh, that the landlord has no knowledge of the effect. Um, be that as it may, you still need to put that in your notice, serve it on the tenant, um, and bring it to the uh, bring two copies to the possession hearing and make sure that if you're instructing counsel, counsel has those two copies. Um, and we move on from uh, the practice direction of part 55C, I hope, to this new innovation, uh, which is called the overall arrangements. Uh, and there's a link to it uh, at the top of the slide. And this introduces a number of uh, innovations or new things. The first is the review date. Uh, now, there has to be a review date before any substantive hearing of any possession claim now. And uh, essentially what happens is the court, uh, the claimant um, provides the court with an electronic bundle. Uh, it gives the defendant an opportunity to take free legal advice. Uh, the overall arrangements rather optimistically express the view that this will help many cases to settle. Um, although uh, those of us uh, accustomed to turning up at the county courts to try and argue with tenants outside court about possession will uh, possibly take that with a rather large pinch of salt. Um, and uh, if there is no settlement, then there's a short review appointment uh, listed by the court. Uh, it's a five minute document review by a judge right at the end of the day. Um, and what happens then is that if the documents are in order um, and there is no settlement, then the matter will proceed to what is then called the substantive hearing. Uh, now, at the substantive hearing, the parties both attend. It is essentially a normal possession hearing like the good old days. However, unlike the good old days where these hearings used to be listed for five or at best 10 minutes, uh, they are now being listed for 15 um, or sometimes 20 minutes, which is a good thing because it means actually that you can um, have a proper argument uh, and it is possible uh, to have a, a bigger bite of the cherry at getting possession at a first hearing where the tenant has put in a defence, uh, but that defence is not particularly arguable. In the old days where there was just five minutes, you'd get short shrift from a district judge, uh, but now uh, given the longer time limits, the judges are under more of a, uh, an obligation actually to have to hear the parties. And what happens uh, at that claim is that the court either decides the claim, uh, gives an order for possession, uh, or gives suitable directions, or, or in particular cases, perhaps where there's a possession claim and a money claim, uh, the court might give judgment for possession and then give directions for the uh, determination of the money claim, which is a, a, an order I got recently. Um, the key concepts uh, of the overall arrangements uh, for practitioners really are prioritization and COVID-19 case marking. Um, and uh, prioritization is explained in the overall uh, arrangements. It says the following cases warrant listing with priority, antisocial behavior, this one is particularly important, extreme alleged rent arrears, which is where you have 12 months rent or nine months rent where it amounts to more than 25% of a private landlord's total annual income from any source. Uh, good luck trying to prove that. Um, other cases warranting prioritization are cases involving squatters, domestic violence, fraud or deception, um, unlawful subletting, abandonment, uh, and also, importantly, claims which were actually issued before the stay, which are, by this point, uh, rather long drawn out. And the other thing to be aware of is this new thing called COVID-19 case marking, uh, which the, the purpose of which is to draw attention to cases where a claimant, i.e. a landlord, may be in a particular difficulty as a result of the pandemic. Uh, 
Um, so this gives you an opportunity to rebut what the overall arrangements apparently assume to be uh, the case, which is that it is the tenant, uh, the, de the defendant tenant, who is the, the party who has been put in difficulty as a result of the pandemic. So if you are a landlord and uh, you yourself have been on furlough or you've lost your job and you're dependent on this for income or you're struggling to make your uh, mortgage repayments or, uh, or struggling to put food on the table, this is your opportunity uh, to make that clear to the court. Um, and because COVID case 19 uh, uh, COVID-19 case marking assists with listing, that will help your case to get on sooner and hopefully for possession to be recovered and judgment to be entered, uh, which for a claimant in that position will no doubt be a good thing. Um, any defendant or any private claimant uh, is entitled to request a COVID case mark at any stage and by any means. The only requirement is that they have to provide certain specified information in the overall arrangements and they have to inform other parties. If there is no objection, uh, then the request will result in case marking. And if a party does object, uh, then the court will decide the matter on the documents. Uh, so finally, then some, some tips uh, drawing all of these threads together. Um, it's important, I, I, I cannot stress enough, the need to check and double check the notice period. Whether you're uh, using a Section 8 notice or a Section 21 notice, make sure uh, that you are specifying the correct notice period um, and uh, have reference to the gov.uk website uh, for that very helpful indicator of what you need to, uh, to, to, to specify. Um, and of almost equal importance, make sure you are using the correct prescribed form for your Section 21 or your Section 8 notice, because that will obviously make it significantly harder uh, to specify the wrong period. Um, also, uh, it's worth remembering that you should check whether the level of rent arrears is such that you can plead extreme rent arrears in your claim uh, for prioritisation purposes um, and uh, where you're trying to suggest that the, the rent arrears are nine months and more than 25% of, uh, of the landlord's income, then uh, there is an opportunity, to, uh, well, you will need to put in evidence to that effect. Um, and also, if you're looking or, or, or instructed by a claimant landlord who has uh, who is in particular need from the rent or has suffered particularly as a result of the pandemic, then don't forget that you can make use of COVID-19 case marking uh, in order to try to expedite their claim and get a, a sooner judgment. Um, so I hope that that has not put anyone off at getting possession. Um, be careful wading through the thicket of, of, of regulatory thorns. Uh, but if the government is to be believed, uh, then by the 1st of October, everything should be more or less back to normal. Uh, and on that cheery note, uh, I will uh, draw to a close um, and uh, we will move on to questions. Thank you very much, Tom. Um, we have um, run over a little bit, uh, not too much, but just a little bit. So just wrapping things together before taking a couple of questions. People are obviously free to go. Uh, if they need to. Uh, written papers will be available if they've been written. So if, where people have produced papers, they will be made available. Um, so far as the questions are concerned, we've got, uh, we've had a number of interesting questions um, and we'll just take a couple before we close. Um, there's a question from um, someone about occupation going right back to the beginning, vacant possession. Does giving up occupation given that it's less onerous than vacant possession, simply enable the tenant to vacate and lock up? And would that be compliance? Um, in relation to that, well, yes, um, giving up occupation is generally regarded as being less onerous than vacant possession. And all that is necessary for a tenant to do is manifest an intention no longer to occupy. Um, so arguably that might involve simply handing back of keys and walking away. Um, but it may not be enough because if there are um, vast contents of things, chattels, rubbish and such like left in the premises, that still might be a manifestation of an occupation by a tenant. So if I were advising a tenant, I would say get as close as possible to giving up vacant possession and for the avoidance of doubt. So back to the cautious advice, um, but don't strip out any bits of the premises themselves. Um, so that's that one. There's a question, um, I think, for you, Nick. Um, in relation to um, the panel Pino and the Brexit case. So in, that, in those cases, the court looked at the amount of the term left outstanding. What exactly is the relevance of the length of the outstanding term? You're on mute, Nick. Uh, <clears throat> always the way, isn't it? <laughs> um, yeah, it's an interesting question because in, in all of the frustration cases, the, the, the court, first of all, looks at the, the impact of, 
of the changing circumstances on the outstanding obligations. But in panel Pina, the only person who, who addressed the point was Lord Simon, who said it's also relevant to look at what's happened previously. Uh, what about the discharged obligations? Should they be taken into account? Um, I think that's important because, I mean, imagine this situation. Imagine that you've got a 10 year lease at the beginning of which the tenant made significant uh, alterations to the premises and the reinstatement covenant is only triggered on yielding up. Uh, and then imagine that an allegedly frustrating event happens uh, only a week before the end of the term. Uh, well, can't be right can it the tenant can have nine and three quarter years worth of enjoyment of the premises and then walk away from the onerous uh, reinstatement obligation uh, just because the frustration event had right at the end it seems to me that the, the proper answer is although the, the court always has to look at the um, all the surrounding circumstances to try and work out what the magnitude of the impact on the uh, contract is of the change in circumstances. Because I think the real answer is that the allocation of risk always lies on the tenant. I don't think that actually the, the outstanding length of term has an awful lot to do with it in reality. And if it does, then it will always have to be balanced against what the benefits that the parties have had from prior performance of the contracts. Mim, back to you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Right, so lastly, I think, unless Tom wants to take one specific question, we've got one for Richard. Richard, if, if a landlord, someone's asked, if a landlord contacts a guarantor after the grace period for payment of rent, which would then allow the landlord to forfeit, to say, so contacts the guarantor to say the tenant has not been paid and requiring payment, but doesn't contact the tenant, would that amount to a waiver? Uh, I think probably there's a couple of, points there um, would seeking to exercise rights against a guarantor count as communicating acts to the tenant just on the premise that what you were doing was a waiver mm. um, I think it would be very high risk to rely on an argument that it wasn't communicated to the tenant if you were seeking to go by the guarantor so mm. I suspect acts against the guarantor that are waivers probably would be taken to be communicated to the tenant yeah uh, whether seeking to recover sums from the guarantor would be a waiver. I think probably the position is analogous to the sums you can demand from the tenant. So sums which predate the breach you're relying on, your rights against the guarantors will survive any forfeiture you would seek to bring and probably wouldn't be a waiver. But if you started to seek from the guarantor sums post-dating any period, post-dating your breach, uh, then you would have waived in my view. Thank you, Richard. Don't disagree with any of that. Um, right, well, we're now at 23 minutes past, so that ends it for today. Thank you so much for joining us. I hope you found the, the talks informative and useful. And as I said at the beginning, uh, it's recorded and you'll be uh, receiving papers where they're available. Many thanks and enjoy the rest of your day.